Uh, hi, my name is Eric. I work at GitHub in the platform organization. And for the past 18 months, my team and I have been working on making Spiffy Inspire available for engineers internal to GitHub. And uh, we have been running Spire in production for the past year. Uh, GitHub submission is to be the home for all developers. We are the world's largest subversion repository management company, and we also hold, host Git. Uh, that also is something we do. So uh, the goal of this talk is to provide something of a practitioner story for a team trying to make this available internally for a company that has around 15 or well, 11 years of infrastructure opinion, uh, is not fully running on a public cloud, but runs on multiple public clouds, some of which may start with the letter A. And um, I really want to talk about two implementation details of how we operate Spire today. The first is how we operate our agents. And the second is how we generate custom node selectors to support registration entries for vending SFIDs to workloads. And I'll try to wrap it up with some takeaways and learnings and outcomes that we've achieved on the team. And as a full disclaimer, this is how we do it. This is not how to do it. And I'd like to thank uh, Ben Burry from my team who reminded me to give this disclaimer to people because um, we don't want to present our work as what you should do. It is a contextual solution for our setup. So to start things off, we talk about motivations. Um, as I said a moment ago, GitHub runs their own data centers. Uh, we run on multiple clouds. Um, in the past two years, we've been ramping up the product offerings. We've been generating more traffic, more traffic worldwide. Um, we've actually taken measurements um, internally for TCP flows, and we've kind of shown like a linear growth in internal traffic. So there are more things talking to each other inside the DMZ than before. And there are more data centers than before. Um, on top of that, there's been a lot of hiring and new services, net new products, uh, packages, SysGA. Um, uh, trying to remember what I can and can't talk about. But go to the change log. It's very well written. Uh, there are a lot of things coming out. And there's a lot of software behind what's coming out. Um, in addition to that, kind of the past two years have shown acquisitions. GitHawk um, was acquired, NPM, Semmel. These acquisitions bring their own infrastructure, their own opinions, their own systems. And so we kind of took great pains to be sympathetic to how our colleagues are coming to the organization and how they want to work with us. So um, how do we kind of plan for all this variation in what run at what runs at GitHub and, and where it runs. Um, we initially were interested in Spiffy because it's extensible and open. Um, for example, the, I think uh, in Evan and Andrew's presentation, they talked about the upstream CA plugins of which Spire is itself one. Uh, we run Vault internally and we don't necessarily want to build a parallel PKI infrastructure just to support Spire. The goal is should, should be to reuse as much as we possibly can and um, to leverage everything that we have done that already works well. Um, and point three, which I think didn't actually make the slide is um, we have workloads that leverage L4 load balancers. So some groups use just JOT SVID, some groups seem to use X509, uh, we use both. So we can support your use case, whether you're mediated by a load balancer or, or not. Um, talking a little bit about the approach, um, good tools have gradations of power. And um, we're trying to make our platform offering as modular as possible. So um, visually, you could kind of think of it as a pyramid, where as you go up the pyramid, um, you have uh, a reduced sort of area where that's curation. So at the very bottom, we have these interfaces of X509 SVID and JOT SVID where if teams were to actually conform to these themselves, um, they could potentially just be in spec because this is an open standard. This is more of a utility than a strategy um, component of how GitHub uses technology. And in the center, uh, we want to be the team that operates a centralized Spire infrastructure. Um, 
stands up the servers, manages the data store, manages the infrastructure automation for agents, and provides sort of a workload API out of the box for teams in whatever execution environment they're running in. And uh, for teams that don't necessarily want to deal with raw infrastructure, at the very top, where we hope to land almost everybody is um, development tools. So shared libraries, packages, and uh, we've also, I think everybody in the industry has developed a sidecar at one point or another. It's kind of like making your own web framework in 2020. Everyone just does it. I don't know. Uh, we've developed an external authorization speaking sidecar and external authorization as in um, Envoy. So we can actually use Envoy to inject and validate JOT tokens coming in and out of your service. Um, this use case is particularly uh, applicable for dynamic languages um, where we may not necessarily want to go too deep into the app. We don't want to do too much surgery on the workload or be kind of intimately involved in the internals or something that we're really just trying to uh, mediate authentication with using Spiffy. So I'm going to talk about how we initially approach the Spire setup with the agents. So um, take one, we initially started experimenting with Spire running in, in Kubernetes. Uh, we run Kube internally um, and we wanted to actually leverage that team's good work and all of their kind of gains in reliability and, and operability to not necessarily be managing VMs metal ourselves. And the kind of reference architectures we've seen um, in the community are services as, um, as in kube services to run Spire servers and agents running as daemon sets per node. We observed some issues after kind of kicking this around for a little while in the first, um, first month or so, um, in particular with um, agents. So daemon sets can't be made highly available. Um, they're, they're unbounded in downtime between deploys. And you're actually kind of relying on the kube scheduler to place a pod to replace the pod that was the daemon set. So that, that was a challenge. Um, workloads also can't rely on Spire being available at, at startup because of this non-determinism related to the scheduler. Um, so all workloads or whatever curation we provide to users would have to implement some sort of retry or blocking mechanism to kind of pull or wait for the workload API. Not, not the end of the world, but um, kind of a, another small piece of complexity rather than relying on the invariant of a workload API being there and ready waiting for your workload on startup. And um, something that's kind of a subtlety is um, the dual of that race condition is draining a node. So we may actually drain the daemon set before we drain the workload. So if we pull the daemon set and Spire disappears, the workload may actually be waiting or accessing the workload API with no agent listening. Um, also, not everything we run is in kube for very obvious reasons. Uh, we would have to sort of synchronize infrastructure automation to cover both agents in and out of hosts. And some kube nodes probably would need um, both. There are probably workloads resident on kube nodes that might have to reach in or so that would imply we would run two Spire agents. Um, that, was, that was the challenge. So we resolve these issues by, in our case, just running the Spire agent as a regular daemon. So we kind of avoid the problem of pod schedule ordering by avoiding the Kubernetes scheduler entirely. And we kind of make Spire part of the second party software we lay down on a kube node before um, the kubelet starts to take work um, from the API server. So this mitigates some of the race conditions. I mean, it's probably still good resilient practice to pull or wait for a workload API, but this problem is largely mitigated by just making sure that the workload API is resident before the pod is started. And uh, the dual maintenance goes away because everything is just one um, 
set of infrastructure automation. And um, that is actually the system D logo. I went into Google image search. I think it's a green light being pointed to, or maybe it's, a, it's the letter okay. I was debating this with somebody yesterday on a Zoom, but I've never seen it before. Record and play backwards? Maybe. It's like the missing VCR button. I, I don't know. Um, maybe one last thing is uh, systemd kind of allows an ordering of units. Uh, so obviously we can say um, for workload attestation, we would like to start after the kubelet starts. So there's not kind of a false signal about errors being unable to uh, contact the kubelet, things like that. Be kind and rewind, yeah. Um, so if we're actually running this as a um, systemd unit, how do we expose it to pods? Um, a kind of redacted, modified version of the, the wall of YAML for a deployment is on the left. And uh, we kind of take the underlying domain socket, put it into a volume, and just simply mount that into the container within the pod. Um, Kubernetes is kind of a Matryoshka doll, but you know, uh, pods live in templates inside of deployments. That's what this illustrates. Essentially, sort of the, the punchline is um, the view from within the pod is um, identical to a workload running on Metal or VM. Um, it's kind of in this well-known location. It can be relied on to, to be there. Um, we also don't actually use um, mutating webhooks or uh, any sort of pre-deploy machinery to place these in. Our experience has been just instructing teams um, to add these few lines for the volume and um, kind of guaranteeing that whatever cluster they're running on provides this domain socket, gives us a lot of mileage and avoids a lot of um, magic. And people sort of, have, folks have told us that they they appreciate the kind of transparency and how things work and, um, and what's actually going on. So kind of the other consequences, the domain socket is available to things outside of kube as well on kube nodes. So there's that. Uh, the second thing that I wanted to talk a little bit about today is generating custom node selectors. So as I said, Earlier in the talk, GitHub runs in multiple clouds. We use multiple container orchestrators and containers outside of orchestrators, which is also a lot of fun. We, we run Docker bare for some workloads. So the consequence of this is um, we can actually build a service once and run it n ways in n in m places. Um, if we think about how to vend identity to all of these workloads, there's kind of one dimension that's the same, um, which is a selector, which we can gather about the workload using workload attestation, using whatever workload attestation mechanism we are using, maybe the, the Unix workload tester, um, the K8s, SAT, PSAT workload testers. But there's this second piece of where that's slightly more difficult because we run our own sites um, and have our own internal APIs. There's nothing out of the box that knows about internal GitHub APIs in the project understandably because they're private and not public and not based on a public standard. So things like the Node Tester for Amazon Web Services, GCP, Azure, um, which are public products don't apply to us we had to do a little bit uh, extra work to kind of um, propagate similar notions that you get out of these out of the box node testers into our um, selector library. Um, right. Um, one thing I can share about how we uh, run our sites is um, machines have uh, their own um, per machine certs. So we can actually leverage the X509 Papa tester and use sort of um, some of that cert key material um, to, to pull some notion and verify the identity of something trying to phone home to the Spire server. Um, the challenge with the X509 Papa tester 
for us initially was um, it actually takes a fingerprint. I think it's a SHA-1 fingerprint of the machine cert, which doesn't kind of at a glance really give you a semantic meaning of what the agent is or where it is. Um, it's just a opaque checksum. So um, using agent path template in the X509 Papa tester, we actually using this little bit of um, go templating, we pull out the common name from the per machine cert, which does actually contain the fully qualified domain name of the machine we're trying to bootstrap an agent on. So we kind of go from um, Spire agent SHA-1 hash to um, an actual fully qualified domain name when you do a Spire server agent list. Um, let's keep going. So the consequence of actually only having this one verifiable piece of information because the server doesn't necessarily trust the claims of the, the agent in node attestation is that we have to key off of this one datum and um, kind of from the server side cons consult some other trusted API to gather more information about the agent and where it runs. Is it a Kubernetes node? Is it a uh, file server? Is it you know, a, uh, a bastion machine? Things like that are not um, something we can take at face value from the node tester. So we actually have to write um, a custom node resolver that pairs with the um, node tester, the X509 pop node tester. And um, we actually bundled this as an OS package because the interface is just a um, protobuf and gRPC. And we kind of provision the server with knowledge of an allow list of what metadata to pull back because um, every node has um, a set of metadata. We actually, for the purposes of registration entries, care about a subset of that. So the real result of this is we get extra selectors specific to GitHub and how we're running infrastructure for use in registration entries. And as a reminder, registration entries are can be written with workload selectors or node selectors. So that's kind of the, the application and then the um, where it runs piece of how you vend identity. Um, this is a snippet of configuration to illustrate uh, what my mouth noises actually mean in terms of uh, what it would look like on um, a Spire server. So what I've tried to highlight is um, this is also X509 pop, but it's not a node tester, it's a node resolver. And we pass both a plugin command and a plugin checksum. So we're not kind of um, arbitrarily execing random things in the system path. And the way we kind of distribute this plugin command is just as a base OS package using our internal packaging machinery. Um, kind of below that, the plugin data is um, interpreted in our own um, code for the node resolver to unpack uh, the node attributes that we want as this allow list to pull things in um, and make them selectors. Because if we were to pull everything in, um, there's no actual utility of knowing maybe uh, what top of rack switch a machine is connected to or um, what yeah, things like that are just kind of superfluous. So the result of this is we get extra selectors for Spire to use in registration activities. An example of this is um, the one verifiable claim, which is the common name out of the machine cert is used as the kind of um, key we key off of in our internal registry API to pull out um, these other selectors, which I've highlighted in um, white and with a kind of a canary yellow box. It looked different when I was making it, but I, the point is the same. It's all highlighted there. And uh, you can kind of see that these are prefixed um, similar to how we uh, structure the node resolver. 
So it's GHAPI GitHub rather than X509 subject, X509 CA. And um, these are now kind of available to us to, to write registration entries in addition to workload um, selectors. Um, so trying to wrap it up with some takeaways. Uh, the benefits we've had are we've replaced kind of custom non-interoperable authentication approaches with a single portable standard with Spiffy and Spire. We didn't have to redo any existing infrastructure concepts. Um, we didn't have to kind of somehow shuttle in um, information from the inventory APIs. We just used them as any other client. And um, Spire has a lot of points of extension to, to call more data and to, to verify more claims about agents. And um, as a result of that, rather than having teams manually manage certs and onboard new clients, we kind of reduced the cost of experimentation for them collaborating with other people in the engineering department because um, your new downstreams become just registration entries that are identity documents that you can verify um, from the caller. And um, we've kind of shifted uh, a lot of work, which could be thought of as strategy work into utility work. And um, the kind of future vision is to make this uh, just a given for all teams at GitHub to use. Um, and uh, some other observations that we've made, um, universalizing authorization. I think this is something we talk a lot about in the community, um, Spiffy for authentication and authentication only, having no opinion about authorization. That, that actually has been kind of a point of leverage for us um, because systems and teams have either invented their own, may have an interest in standardizing, may not have an interest in standardizing, um, and, and fine-grained ACLs um, are not something we necessarily want to try to provide parity with, in our opinion, at the top of the pyramid uh, in one of the earlier slides. We really just want to give people documents that they can verify are good or not good. There are no goals to kind of build policy languages or, or enforce policy languages to replace what we have already. Um, and I think I'm bumping up against time, but one other observation that we've made is being forced to write registration entries to identify the shapes of workloads is a forcing function for discussions about blast radiuses and security perimeters. Um, if you can't actually differentiate between two workloads cohabitating a machine with a registration entry, that means they have kind of the same level of privilege um, inappropriately. So rather than kind of looking at, oh, we can't take this and isolate it from this other thing because they're running as the same user or they're um, in the same group. We, we kind of inverted that and, and saw these um, exercises in discriminating between what gets what SVID as opportunities to improve our security posture. So that's invited some interesting conversations about um, everything from um, how we kind of uh, build machine certs to um, how we run certain things in Coop. So there's that. And um, I'm going to go to the last slide, which is just the silhouette and stop sharing here. Eric, you, you make a great point on, on recognizing workloads just as granular as possible. How granular is too granular? Is it enough just to distinct one from the other? Or do you try to get as prescriptive as you can of every single uh, property and aspect uh, to identify a, a given workload? I think we partner up with teams and, and it's situational. Um, there are workloads that literally run in dual modes. So they actually, it necessitates them getting both documents, even though it's the same um, executable. We have kind of code paths where they're both libraries and they're, they have main functions. Um, so it, it, it depends, you know, team to team to team. Uh, my perspective is, um, kind of, it, it's sort of like a, when you enter a code base and there's like 15 million unit tests and you change one character and like half of them break, you know, that kind of anti-fragility with wide enough registration entries is, is probably the preferred approach. Because if something is so brittle where you need a control loop to kind of endlessly reconcile it by Docker image ID 
or you need to keep track of um, node appearance and death, then that's probably the wrong shape. But every organization is different. Um, you know, mandates are different, priorities are different. Um, we, we largely just partner with the teams and, and try to have the discussion and facilitate what Spire can do for them. That's, that's great guidance. Thank you. Certainly put for thought for, for the attendees. Thank you very much. Uh, to echo the, the, the last comment in chat, Eric, you're an awesome presenter. Nice work. Thanks. Thank you all for taking the time.